This is from an adult man that is a non-local member of our church. And he said, I've been a Christian for over 30 years. I'm struggling with assurance of salvation. I've committed some really bad sins while being a Christian. Is there any hope for me? Wow. So That's a softball. Is it what? That was a slow pitch softball. Was it? Yeah. Well, then go ahead and answer no, it. No, you know oh, okay. it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a question that uh, I have gotten a lot over the years. Uh, how... I've really screwed up. I feel like a failure. I feel like I've done too many bad things to be loved by God, to be accepted by God. Um, what, <clears throat> where is my hope? And my immediate answer to anybody who asks that question is, if you weren't a Christian, if you weren't loved by God, this wouldn't even bother you. Okay, that's the first thing to say. The first thing to say is, uh, you're good because this bothers you. <laughs> Uh, if it didn't bother you, then I would be concerned. But uh, the fact that it does and you're concerned about uh, your love for God and God's love for you says that um, God's love exists in you. Um, and so I would, the first thing I would say is uh, I understand, I completely understand. Um, I too have been in seasons of life where I have uh, just screwed up bad enough or did enough bad things to wonder whether or not I really knew God or whether or not God could ever love me. And, um, and you know, I think it's really important because we will all at different times in our life ask that question. Either overtly we will ask it explicitly or we'll think it. Uh, we'll wonder. I still wonder. I mean, it's impossible not to wonder because we're conditional people living in a conditional world with other conditional people. It's almost impossible not to wonder from time to time, is this really true? I mean, could God really love me unconditionally? I mean, I'm a mess. And if it's not the things that I do, then it's the things that I think. If it's not the things that I think, it's the things that I feel or the things that I fail to do or fail to think or fail to feel. Uh, I mean, could God really love me? So it's, a, it's an understandable question, and I think it's one that most people will ask at some point in time in their lives, especially when they're down and when they feel bad. Um, but I would say, and it's something I reiterate uh, almost on a weekly basis that God's love for you and God's acceptance of you has nothing to do with you. And I think I would just, if he were sitting here, I would look at him in the eye, whoever this is, and I would say, you have to remember, go back to Romans 8, the great eight that chapter in the Bible which begins with the Apostle Paul saying, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. None. There may be some horizontal consequences for stupid things we do. Obviously, we experience that. But there is no vertical condemnation. That's been taken care of. Um, and then it ends, that chapter ends with the Apostle Paul saying, uh, nothing in heaven and nothing on earth can separate you from God's love. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing you do or nothing you fail to do can separate you from God's love because God's love for you is not dependent on you. God's love for you is dependent entirely on what Jesus has done for you. So the, uh, the wavering feelings we may get regarding whether or not God loves us doesn't change the fact that he does love us. And our feelings will waver from time to time. Our, our awareness of God's love for us will waver from time to time, often because of something we do or something we fail to do. But the, our feelings about that stuff doesn't change the fact that because of Jesus... We're in forever. We have been justified, and we will one day be glorified. That is, that is a truth that no matter how hard we may resist it or try to fight against it, remains true nonetheless. And so um, those are the things that 
uh, I not only need to remember, but I need other people to remind me of when I'm feeling low. And, um, and you know, because I, I've told you the story before about the time I was putting Jenna to bed when she was small. And, and I asked her, honey, how do you think God feels about you? And she said, uh, disappointed. She was probably eight or nine years old. And I thought, disappointed, where have I failed to do my job as a parent? I mean, my gosh, this is the stuff that I live by. And my daughter is my daughter. I mean, you would expect my kids to get it. But my daughter wonders or thinks that God is disappointed in her. And I asked her, I said, honey, what makes you think that? And she said, well, because, you know, she essentially said, because God is good and I'm, I'm not. God is I'm, I, I sin, God doesn't, God's perfect, I'm imperfect. So it just stands to reason that God is disappointed in me. And I had the opportunity at that point to remind her that God's love for you is in no way dependent on you. It's dependent on what Jesus has done for you. And um, God is pleased with you because of the cloak of righteousness that is wrapped around you. Um, so anyway, I would say something like that to him if he <laughs> were sitting here. Don't you find that uh, because we know that if we're bad enough, we will lose earthly relationships because they're conditional. We all have limits. So it stands to reason that we would think we would lose our relationship with God. Yeah. So if I was saved and then I did something really terrible, I would be not saved. Because that's, that's the question that we or get a lot. if God loved me and then right. I did something really bad, God would stop loving me. Right. Have a relationship versus not having one. Because we're yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. I think we assume that that's the way God is with us because that's the way we are with one another. You know, there are things that we could do to one another that would cause each other to walk away to stop loving. I don't want you in my life anymore. You you're 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 toxic. You're you're bad. You've hurt me too you've hurt me too much. Um, and that's understandable. Uh, we live in a fallen world and we are fallen people and we break things by nature. Um, and so we have this human propensity to mess things up and um, and we do that with relationships all the time. Uh, and we look back on those with regret and guilt and shame in some ways, but we assume that because I can do something to lose your love, that must stand to reason that I can then do something to lose God's love. But God's love is different than our love. His is perfect. Ours is imperfect. Um, God's love is unconditional. Ours is conditional. Even though we may be able to love unconditionally in moments our unconditional love is interrupted by conditionality throughout the day, even with the people who are closest to us. The unconditionality of God's love is never interrupted. In fact, it can't be interrupted because of who God is. So, yes, I would concur with that. You brought up Romans 8, which you love. And that was actually my next question. Um, you love that passage, specifically Romans 8, 1. Will you tell everybody what that is? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you started talking about the vertical relationship versus horizontal relationship. And sometimes that's confusing to people, whether it's a salvific answer, like I might lose my salvation because I've been really bad, but explain the vertical versus the horizontal for people so that no vertical condemnation doesn't mean no horizontal condemnation. God may not condemn me for what I do, but you may as a person. Well, I mean, I would never condemn you well, for anything I'm, you do. So I don't, know what, else would. I don't know what you're implying Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Pelliquin would. <laughs> no. So, okay, so, you're, so the question, I, I, you want me to articulate the distinction between no vertical condemnation mm -hmm. And, uh, and horizontal consequences? Is that what you well, asked me to do? Well, both, and just the, the distinction between the, two re, the, between the two planes, between those two relationships, because we so often get that um, convoluted, and we see them as the same thing. And just because there may not be any judgment from God, it doesn't mean there isn't judgment from others horizontally. Also consequences. Yes. Jesus took our consequences yes. that we deserve 
vertically, but we may suffer our consequences horizontally here mm -hmm. still, and we are, yes. we all are. So explain that to, I don't know, to, to people in light of just understanding, because sometimes people come in to the sanctuary because we are a judgment-free zone, but it's because of what Jesus has done that we're saying there's no judgment from God here that we're speaking of. But that doesn't mean you may not find judgment from the person sitting next to you. Horizontally, we're still an imperfect group of people. Mm -hmm. And so explaining the vertical versus horizontal so that we don't impose what we get vertically to those horizontally because that happens a lot. Um, we think that... What about perpendicular? Perpendicular. Also perpendicular. Okay. Isn't that another one of those Because you use those two phrases what a lot. What is perpendicular, by the way? They're going like this. Okay. Perpendicular. Parallel perpendicular. The perpendicular, perpendicular consequences. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're not going to introduce that. Okay. Well, I would be happy to uh, I would be happy to articulate that and explain that, but I think you just did. So what's the next no. question? <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Yeah. See? She's the brains behind the That's operation, not true. folks. I learned uh, that from oh, him. Okay, so okay, let me let me take a stab at this, um, which we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, it is very true that when we say, for instance, um, that the sanctuary is a judgment-free zone, we're not lifting that phrase, by the way, from Planet Fitness, okay? Because <laughs> uh, that place has judgment all over all the place, over man. I, it was the only gym that was near our house when we lived in Fort Myers, and so I had to stoop so low as to get a membership there, all right? Uh, and, um, and, you know, I had no idea what Planet Fitness was. And then they have this big alarm on the wall that if you drop a weight, it goes off and embarrasses you in front of the entire gym. Well, I didn't know that. They literally describe the person they're actually judging. Right, so they're right judgment next to... judgment-free except for that guy. But, so, you judge him. But it's like, says, you know, no judgment here, judgment-free zone. And then I drop a weight a little bit too hard, and an alarm goes off, pointing me out as sort of the perpetrator. I'm like, I feel radically judged right now, everybody. Okay, publicly judged. Anyway, when we talk about a judgment-free zone, you're correct. We don't mean that we come into a room where we don't judge one another, because we inescapably do. We are all much more self-righteous than we would like to believe or admit. Um, we're not talking about that. Uh, there is no place on earth where humans are that is a judgment-free zone. Wherever there, is hum wherever there are humans, there is judgment, okay? Uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious, whether it's explicit or implicit, there's, there's judgment. We're critiquing one another. Uh, we're evaluating one another. We're keeping score on one another. We find ourselves thinking better about ourselves because we're better than the person over there. Whatever the case may be, we are perpetually judging, measuring ourselves against other people and hoping to end up on top. Okay, so we're not saying that. There is plenty of judgment in this room every Sunday and every time these doors are open. What we mean when we say judgment-free zone, for instance, is that when we come here, we are blessedly reminded that because of what Jesus has done for us, the red doors, uh, there is no judgment from God. That all of the judgment we deserved was taken care of a long, long time ago. Uh, so before God, there is now no condemnation vertically, okay? So this relationship is situated, it's settled. We talk about living our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. Uh, that is a description of the vertical relationship that God has with us and that we have with him. Uh, now, to the degree that that vertical relationship with God begins to spill out into our horizontal relationships with one another, there's joy and peace and gladness and all of those things, um, pleasure, all of those things. But, but we, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, have a propensity to mess things up, to screw things up. Um, and so Stacy and I, for instance, can have three great days or four great days where we're just in sync. And then we have a day where we're not in sync. 
and she's being selfish and I'm being selfish and we're not being gracious toward one another and we're kind of being snippy or reserved or whatever. That's, you know what I'm talking about. That stuff happens all the time. Okay, we're like They that. don't know. They don't do that. Huh? <laughs> no, oh, they do. do. <laughs> no, they do. I watch it. I watch these losers do it to one another all the time. <laughs> uh, so, um, but, so, I mean, that, there, there, uh, there is a difference when we talk about vertical and horizontal. That's what we're talking about. Um, and the consequence of not making that distinction is what Stacy alluded to a few minutes ago, that we inevitably think that because I can do something to lose Ray's love, that must mean that I could do something to lose God's love. That we impose on God the conditions and the rules that we sort of uh, impose on one another. And, and I th- sometimes don't you think that we do vice versa? What do you mean? We impose on people how God loves us. And you should love me. If I'm doing that, then I look to you to love me flawlessly. I look to you to yeah, love I me understand. perfectly. So we do both. Yes, that's very, yeah, it's great, 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 great point. Yeah, we do. Uh, the, the, the consequence, the other side of the coin consequence of not uh, maintaining that distinction is that now I am looking to Stacy to be for me and to love me in ways that only God can love me, okay? And only, the only ways that God, something's going on out there. Someone go, someone go grab your children. I'm just kidding. No, not, not you, Ken. They'll be scared to death if you go out there. That you might be a out. good thing. <laughs> If Ken goes Ken out there, the those kid kids regular. will never come back to church. You just stay right where you are. Uh, <laughs> no judgment, Ken. No judgment. We're not judging you. We're just stating a fact. Uh, so, um, so yeah. I mean, I think that if it's true that if I if I don't understand or maintain that distinction, now I am. Uh, not imposing God's love on you, but I'm expecting you to love me the way only God can love me. And the moment I do that, I put a pressure on you that you're not built to bear. You're not capable of bearing. And then we do this to one another all the time in relationships. And then we get extremely disappointed with one another because uh, we're not coming through for one another. We're not meeting one another's expectations. And oftentimes when we step back and look at why we're so resentful toward people, it's because they haven't been for us what we needed them to be for us in one way, shape, or form. And if we look at it and evaluate it a little bit more, analyze a little bit more, then what we may discover is this person isn't even capable of doing what I'm expecting or what I need in the deepest places. Only God is, so. Love that. Um, This question actually comes from one of our students in Refuge. Uh, Refuge is our student ministry of middle school and high school students, if you don't know. So uh, this student says, does God's grace outweigh God's justice? And can you explain the difference? Does God's grace outweigh, outweigh God's, God's justice? justice. Um, so I would say that when you look at the cross, what you see is a meeting of those two things in a way that make them inseparable. Okay? So when you look at the cross, you see the justice of God uh, in the sense that... Um, Payment for sin is being made. There is a rendering happening at the cross. There is a rendering. Now, thankfully, uh, Jesus is taking the judgment that we deserve, but, um, but there is justice is happening at the cross. But at the same time, uh, amazing grace is on radical display at the cross. Um, that at the cross, not only do we see God's justice being satisfied, but we see God's grace being amplified. Um, Because what's happening there is that the punishment we deserve is being taken by someone else, which is an act of massive, radical grace. So I would say that in the character of God, in the economy of God, while justice and grace don't seem to... uh, 
come together in our minds and in our economy. They come together perfectly in God's economy. I'm reminded of that line uh, uh, from Robert Frost um, where he says, nothing makes injustice just but mercy. And I think you see that at the cross. I think in this day and age when we are constantly hearing cries for justice all over the place, it's wise to remember that nothing makes injustice just but mercy. And that's what we see at the cross. So I wouldn't pit the two against one another or say that one's bigger than the other. Um, I would just say that both coexist perfectly in the way God acts. And he acts in such a way where at the end of the day, Grace wins, so. So it outweighs. I wouldn't say you that. Wouldn't I would say be. That. I would be. I would be cautious to say it outweighs. Okay. Because that would be putting. Um, that would be saying that uh, there's there's sort of a linear, you know, numbering one, two, three, and grace is at the top, and then down here is justice. I would say it's more horizontal. Gotcha. Or perpendicular. Perpendicular. <laughs> Parallel. Parallel. Um, this is one from someone on our staff. Okay. What do you want to know, honey? <laughs> you could have just it's asked not me. me this at home. It's not me though. Who is Martin Luther and why did he leave the Catholic church? That is not a question from someone on our staff. Yes, it is. Well, then that person needs to be fired because they should know the answer to that question. So tell it me is, who it is. It is tell for, us all who it, it is. It is for these lovely kidding. people to I'm know just, because it's a great. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That person's listening kidding. also. I'm sure and they are. You. And I hope that they are put on notice right now. Um, just kidding. So who was Martin Luther? Well, that's a massive, massive question. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk. Uh, that was born in the late 1400s. Um, he trained to be an attorney. Uh, he was trained to be an attorney. His father desperately wanted him to be an attorney. Uh, he was on his way home from somewhere and got stuck in a lightning storm. And uh, lightning struck so close to where he is, it knocked him off of his horse, and he was scared to death for his life. And he said, God, if you get me out of this jam, I will become a monk. Well, God got him out of the jam, and true to his word, he became a monk, much to his father's dismay. Um, And he was the best monk that had ever lived in terms of his understanding of sin and guilt. Uh, His time in a monastery was incredibly interesting, um, as he was trained to be a, a Roman Catholic monk, because he was so overwhelmed with his own imperfections in light of God's perfection that he couldn't even understand how going to confession, for instance, could solve the problem. Because he would say, I would go in there and I would confess everything I could imagine to confess. Things I had done, things I had left undone, things I had thought, things I should have thought that I didn't think, all of that stuff. And he said, I'd go in there for hours and hours and hours. He said, and as soon as I would leave the confessional, I would think of 10 more things I forgot to say. And so I would have to go back in. I mean, he would beat himself and beat himself and beat himself. And then one day as he was... uh, preparing to teach a class on Romans, he came across Romans chapter 1, verse 17, which says, and the just shall live by faith. And God used that verse in Martin Luther to awaken an understanding of who God is and the gospel that literally changed history from that point forward. From that point forward, he realized that we are made right with God, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus has done. That was his central understanding, that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Jesus alone, period. Well, he started teaching that, and you know, that was disrupting the entire Catholic system in his day. And so he started to get in trouble. He started getting questioned from his authorities. And then all of a sudden, that turned into a lot more stuff. He wrote uh, 95 statements of dissent in terms of what he believed the Bible said in in comparison to what the Roman Catholic Church said. And he nailed those to uh, the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. The church door in those days in those small villages was like the town bulletin board. 
And so he wrote these 95 theses, they call them, down, and he nailed it to the church door, and he just thought it would stir up some discussion amongst he and his students and maybe some of the townspeople. Well, uh, that took off. It went viral, as they say, and people started making copies of it, and people were passing it out all over the place, and before long, uh, all of Germany had a handle on or had their hands on Martin Luther's 95 Theses. So um, a real disruption had started, and Luther was a bombastic kind of guy, somebody that I would have probably really gotten along with. He didn't have much of a filter. He said what he thought. Um, he was very, very intelligent, but he knew how to say things very poignantly. Um, he was fighting a war. I mean, it was Martin Luther against the entire church of that era. Now, you got to remember, before this, there were no Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists. All, there was Protestantism didn't exist, okay? And that's what Protestantism is. It's everything you probably know to be Christianity or Christian religion or whatever, Methodist or uh, non-denominational or Episcopalian or Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever. That's all of those branches were formed from what Martin Luther did way back when. So up until that point, it was only the Roman Catholic Church. That was it. That was the church. There was only one. Um, and Luther was standing against it by himself, standing against it because he was so convinced, so convinced um, of the gospel and that what the Bible said about the, who God is and how God makes us right with him was very different from what the Roman Catholic Church was saying. And he was willing to die on that hill, willing to die on it. In fact, I have tattooed down uh, my arm here. Here I stand because Martin Luther was put on trial and the, uh, the Roman Catholic authorities asked him to um, recant all of his writings. And he was scared. He knew that if he didn't, he would not only be expelled from the church, but that there would most likely be a contract taken out on his life. And so um, he asked for uh, a recess. He literally asked for a recess. He said, can I, can I come back tomorrow and give you my answer? And they said, sure. So he went back to his room and literally on his face all night long prayed, 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 God, is this true? Is this true? And if it is, then give me the strength and the boldness to stand up for it, even if they take my life. And so the next day, he goes back to court, so to speak. And they say, uh, you know, Martin Luther, uh, would you, are you willing to recant all of your writings and what you say, what you said you believed? And he said, uh, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. And that was it. That was the end of the trial. And then they kind of, some people rushed him out and there were assassination attempts on him. He was able to hide away in a castle for, uh, for about a year <clears throat> um, and sort of change his appearance. And, and the rest is history. Um, I mean, Martin Luther is my historical hero. Um, I love the fact that he was, uh, that he articulated something so profound in such a simple way, and it proved that that simple truth, that we are made right with God, justified with God because of what God has done. God makes us right with God. We don't make ourselves right with God. That, that is the difference between Christianity and religion, right there. Justification, that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Jesus alone. That is, what's, that is the, the hinge on which Christianity turns. Um, and Luther was, there were other people before Luther, um, but Luther was raised up by God at such a crucial time in history and ended up marrying a nun who was obviously no longer a nun and had kids and wrote a bunch of books and a bunch of stuff and, uh, you know, is one of the most important people to ever live, in my opinion. And what impact did he have on the Bible? What do you mean? I think the Bible... The Bible, had, oh. the Bible being in the hands of the people. Oh, <clears throat> well, yeah. So up until that point, the Bible was, uh, was uh, written in, in a language that the common person couldn't understand. 
And, and that was intentional because people, you, you couldn't read the Bible yourself. You needed a priest to read the Bible to you and interpret the Bible for you. That it, the, the Bible was way too sacred to put into the hands of common folks. Um, well, you know, Luther blew that up. That's absolutely false, and Luther blew that up. And uh, at that time, the, uh, the printing press had just been, Gutenberg's printing press had just been created. And so just in God's perfect timing, um, you know, the Bible was able, to, Luther wrote the Bible, re- translated the entire Bible in the German language of the common people, and then the, pre- the printing press was able to distribute it far and wide so that uh, if you have a Bible in your home, you can thank Martin Luther for that. Seriously, that's no, that's, uh, no exaggeration. You always talk about Martin Luther, so I thought that was a great question just to, for people to understand why you use his words and his wisdom so much because he, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. A, yeah I, I, have, I have Luther tattoos all over me, by the way. Um, <laughs> So, so this this is you know inside my arm is the is the um, Latin word Eustis, and then inside this arm is peccator, and you've heard me say this before, but um, uh, Martin Luther was the one who coined the phrase simul Eustis et peccator, and what that means is we are simultaneously justified and sinful, and the reason that was such a huge huge aha moment for me in college was because I w- I had become a Christian, and I was, had lived sort of a crazy, raucous, rebellious life, and God rescued me from that, and he was changing me on the inside, and, and my desires were changing, and my hunger and my thirst were changing. This is when I was 21, 22 years old, and, um, and, and yet, at the same time, I just, I, I was really, really wrestling with why I still struggled with some of the same stuff. You know, I mean, wasn't I supposed to be a brand new person in, a, in the sense that I, know I would no longer want the things that I used to want, and I would only want the things that God wants me to want? Uh, and yet I found this battle going on, and I was reading a church history book in college, and uh, it was retelling the whole story of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther coined the phrase, simul justus et peccator. And when I read it, I was like, that's it. That's me. I am simultaneously at one and the same time justified before God, and yet I remain sinful. And my remaining sinfulness does not in no way, shape, or form take away from me being justified for God. Vertical, horizontal. Um, so I have that tattooed on my arm. I also have Martin Luther's rose tattooed up here. Um, uh, I have his words. He has words. his face down here on his leg. No, I do Just not. Kidding. I do not. I do not. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Yeah. No, I don't do anything to bring any attention to my legs. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um. No matter how hard I try, nothing works, buddy. Right. <laughs> uh, it's my trainer um, over here. Uh, I, there's a quote by St. Augustine. I shared it with you a couple days ago. Um, and I found it fascinating and insightful and he said the essence of sin is disordered love the essence of sin is disordered love would you agree with that and why i mean this is i don't like this i don't i don't I, we're not doing this ever again okay okay <laughs> um just kidding um let's see the The essence of sin is disordered love. I think that is a valid way to describe the essence of sin. Yes, it's not the only Mm -hmm. way to describe the essence of sin. I like Cornelius Plantinga's definition, Mm -hmm. which is sin is the vandalism of shalom. Mm -hmm. Shalom is a Hebrew word that means peace and wholeness and integration and everything working the way it ought to be working. And he describes sin as the vandalism of that. Mm -hmm. That rather than bringing things together, sin rips things apart. It it, it sort of disintegrates things. It, 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 uh, It shreds things up rather than puts things together. Um... So I like that definition. I think Mm -hmm. this is true also. I mean, you can just ask the reverse question, which is, um, 
the reason that love feels conditional, disordered, uh, unsatisfying perhaps, uh, or it fails to meet your expectations or whatever the case may be, um, is because of the presence of sin. Mm -hmm. So you could put it that way. Uh, I do think also that, and I think this is probably what he, what St. Augustine was getting at, is that um, sin prompts us to love things smaller than God in ways that we should only love God. Okay, so uh, another word for sin in the Bible is idolatry. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this a lot. Idolatry is trusting in something, depending on something, uh, loving something, worshiping something, uh, you know, leaning into something to give our lives worth and value and meaning ultimately that is smaller than God. That's what idolatry is. And I've said that, you know, I mean, that, that means that even the good things in our life can become an idol to us if we begin depending on those things or those people more than we depend on God, which is what I described earlier. If I'm depending on Stacy to be for me what only God has promised to be, not only have I put a burden on her that she was never built to bear, but I have turned her into an idol. I have made her into my savior. You have to come through for me, and you have to be for me what I need you to be in order to be happy. And if you don't, then you don't love me, or you have failed me as my God. Uh, now, we don't use that terminology explicitly, but that's the gist of it. Um, and so, Augustine's quote, I think, uh, sort of champions the same thought mm -hmm. that we uh, sin causes us, it distorts our thinking and our feeling in such a way where we look to things smaller than God to be for us when only God can be. Well, if, um, is it Matthew 22 or 26 where Jesus know. is asked, um, what's the greatest commandment? And he responds and says to love God. And to love others is like it, is what he says. And so when we don't love God first, and we don't have this order of love in our lives, then it's disordered, like yeah. this quote says. And even in the garden, that was evident. They loved themselves more than they loved listening to God, obeying God, loving God. They, they wanted for themselves whatever they wanted. It was a selfish, disordered love. So it's any time we're acting in sin, which is all the time, anything we do is tainted by it. It's in some way a reflection of our disordered love. Would you say that? I think I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, yes, yeah. It's some reflection of us not being able to uh, love God and love others yes. the way it's commanded. Uh, which yes, would be and, and, and I, I would say that the only, I'm only looking at the time. I'm not bored up here. I'm just checking the time to make sure we're not terribly over. Uh, we've got time for one more. But um, yeah, I mean, I would say when, when we do not understand God's love for us, okay, to look at, okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, okay? Um, when we don't, he, he's doing, Jesus is doing a couple of things there. Number one, he's giving us the law. And he's showing us that we don't do either very well at all, okay? That's the first thing. But the second thing he's showing us is there is an order here. And that if I don't, to the degree that I do not understand God's love for me, I'm going to depend on other people to be for me what only God can be. So understanding God's love for me and the reason we talk about it so much around here is because that's what gives the rest of our relationships the air to breathe. When I know that God loves me, come hell or high water, unconditionally, no matter what, um, then my deep desire and need to be loved is therefore satisfied. And while I may then enjoy the love that I get from Stacy, I don't need it in order to breathe. Because the moment I need it in order to breathe and she can't give it to the degree that I feel like I need it, then she becomes the enemy. I begin to resent her for failing me. Um, we do this all the time with one another. So yes, that would be another consequence of disordered love, yes. 
Uh, okay, well, thank you guys, seriously, for uh, sitting there patiently and quietly and listening in on our shenanigans. Um, <laughs> and, um, and we do this, you know, we do this, uh, we'll do it again at the end of June, I think. Um, and so... Uh, if you have questions, and I'm not just talking to people in the room, people online, if you have questions, submit those, and uh, it may get asked, okay, uh, the next time we do this.